the hour of 1.30 having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council will come to order and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Helen Tari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established, we will move on. Are there any statements of disqualification by members on today's agenda? All right, thank you. Uh, this would be the opportunity uh, for closed session comment from the public, either online or anyone who's with us in chambers, regarding our closed session agenda today. Let me see if there's anyone with us in chambers today who wishes to make comments. Seeing and hearing none, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We do not. Do not. We are moving along. Uh, for the record, there are real property items that are going to be discussed. Uh, these are, uh, in addition to other items, items one, two, three, and four on our agenda. These will be in closed session. Let me uh, take a look here. Very good. Without objection or other issues, we will go into closed session at this time. We will return uh, on or about 3.15. Uh, we will not be in session before 3.15 this afternoon. We will reconvene either at that time or in an hour later, depending upon when we finish our business in closed session. At this time, we are in closed session. The hour of 3.15 having arrived and the City Council having Recording completed its work in closed session, the Santa Cruz City Council is back in session and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Helen Tari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Uh, I'm going to take uh, one I'm slightly out of order, the presiding officer's announcements. I want to... Uh, do two things here. One is to uh, extend thanks and, and appreciation from the City of Santa Cruz to Senator Laird and the Speaker and our entire legislative delegation who were so helpful uh, during our break uh, to be able to get uh, additional millions of dollars in to assist us in our shelter efforts with regard to folks experiencing homelessness, a year in which our multi-billion dollar state deficits, the Senator and the Speaker and Assemblymember uh, Pellerin and Assemblymember Addis were, were terrific on our behalf. And I want to extend our thanks and appreciation to them. I would also like to acknowledge and express condolences to former colleague uh, Rochelle Naroyan, who's a partner of a very long standing Jim Jensen, a longtime county employee, terrific individual, passed away unexpectedly during our break, and would like to extend our, our condolences to a former council member. Uh, Naroyan uh, on that uh, difficult time in her life. We are under oral communication. Uh, this would be the opportunity for anyone to address the council on a matter under our jurisdiction, not on today's agenda, for a period not to exceed two minutes, so that people understand how we're going to proceed today. Uh, what we will do is we will take oral communication. In the event there are folks online, we will toggle back and forth. We'll take a person here who's with us. We'll then take a person online back to a person with us. We will do that for a period of time uh, of 30 minutes if there are comments that extend that long. When we arrive at 30 minutes, what we will do is we will suspend then oral communication We'll take up the rest of our regular business, then return to oral communication. So at this point, we're under oral communication. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Hello. My name is Laura Chatham. And this, and I just want to start by showing you this um, article, the ACLU sues city over anti-homeless laws. Now, this is the, the first. It's in Washington and Spokane. But what I'm really here to do today is to read the letter that I've passed out from the Mental Health Advisory Board to um, the County Board of Supervisors. But because it 
it impacts everybody, and we all have to work together. Uh, we, I'd, I'd like to read it to you today. So it starts, to the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, the Santa Cruz Mental Health Advisory Board strongly recommends that the Board of Supervisors take immediate action to help our homeless population by, one, directing the County Behavioral Health Department to work with the Parks and Recreation Department throughout the county to redesign and establish a health and safety focused street cleaning encampment protocol that is trauma sensitive and follows state law requiring the storage and later retrieval of taken property for 90 days. Number two, decrease the cost by decreasing the number of police units at encampment cleanups. This is an issue of public health, not criminal. More than three armed officers is unnecessary, threatening, and expensive. California Civil Code 2080 SC imposes mandatory statutory duties on public entities and their employees and agents to maintain for a minimum of 90 days unattended property over which they have taken charge. Thank you. Do we have any speakers online? Okay, we'll take the next speaker online. They'll continue the... Um, Good afternoon, sir. Hi, person sorry, online. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. And so, are the comments for the bicycle thing now or later? I'm sorry. What is the topic you would like to address? It's the e-bike ordinance. I don't know if that's now or later for the comments. Uh, here is the the rule for oral communication. You may address us on any matter under our jurisdiction, not on today's agenda, for a period of time not to exceed two minutes. What is your desire? Um, I wasn't sure if it's on the agenda now, today or later. I might comments just like, how can people cross the road if the lights don't change? And that's my concern for the safety on the e-bike matter. Um, so that's all I'm concerned because the lights don't change when I'm on the road. Uh, but if I have to go on the sidewalk, I don't want to get a ticket. So that, that, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, let's be careful with the microphone. Hi, everyone. Uh, Fred, Renee, Sonia, Shibra, Shibra, Calitary, Johnson, uh, Martin, Sandy, Scott. Uh, Jim, Jim was a friend of mine when I was a teenager. Jim, uh, it is sad to see that he uh, passed away. Uh, he was a great guy back before the internet uh, allowed us to uh, mask our identities at all times. Uh, Jim was the lone rhino. That was his, uh, his login to the local BBS systems that uh, some of us uh, wasted time with. Um, yeah, my sympathies uh, to uh, Rochelle uh, and his family. Um, I, I guess I've been thinking a lot about um, uh, you know, uh, the kind of the uh, the stack of ambition uh, that that 16, 18 story building that the media sort of, it's not a proposal so much as just kind of a media blitz where they say, well, here's a AI generated thing we could build in theory. And, uh, you know, to me, it's just, it's appalling because you've already kind of really uh, kind of outstripped the local economy's capacity to provide tenants for some of these buildings. I think it's, it, it's, it, the intention is good to, to, to do low-income housing. What I often uh, feel is happening is the building is projected to have, uh, you know, some kind of uh, unrealistic uh, estimate or proposal of, uh, and it gets approved under those circumstances, get an unrealistic uh, number of, uh, of low-income units. And you look at the St. George here, you know, it's uh, uh, 25, 30 years after they establish them, they're being evicted. That's, that's sad that that's happening to people. But what happens with the buildings when you get them uh, produced, uh, 15 seconds to sum up. Um, I just feel from a proposal to produce a building, they should have the same exact number of low income housing, uh, housing elements that they, they propose. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Person online, we'll take the next person online. Good afternoon, welcome to the council meeting. 
Yes, hello. Uh, this is Garrett. Hey, can you hear me better? Yeah. Oh, that's much better. Thank you really? for doing that. I spent 20 bucks on a new mic. There you go. <laughs> anyway, well um, yeah, well, I just want to kind of go back uh, to the uh, electrification last meeting. And uh, I don't know if I really explained myself uh, on one point in particular. And that's that, you know, historically, and this is goes back to our constitution of the no ex post facto laws, that it's been a policy in the building codes, like if you want to remodel your house or do an addition, that that the part that you remodel has to be brought up to code because it's new, new construction, whatever, but you're not forced to bring the rest of your house up to code. And that unless what you remodel makes what you don't remodel less safe or less safe rule. But, uh, you know, uh, and that's the way it's been. And yet what you propose for this re-electrification, it sure seems like you're forcing people to go back and remodel the legal part of their house if they do an addition and something that is really contrary to uh, what has been ever been before. And, and, and it's a little tyrannical. I mean, it, what's so different between that and then just saying, hey, bring your house up to code if you want anything from us, you know? So uh, I, I think you know, you've been led astray by your climate action manager, for instance, on the gas stove thing. You went, you know, there's good law, bad law, unconstitutional law, and, and you're borderlining unconstitutional there to me, kind of tyrannical. And uh, there are exceptions to it. The 2016 plumbing code kind of violates in this way, kind of makes you have to remodel all your bathrooms if you do one. But I, I find it just hasn't been taken to court sufficiently yet by someone who cares has the money to do it. So I want you to consider that in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello. I just wanted to continue reading the letter from the Mental Health Advisory Board that we began reading earlier. Um, police departments are not storing the items taken during encampment cleanups. Police-assisted street cleaning, commonly referred to as sweeps, takes place across the county. So survival equipment and valuable personal items are thrown into parks and recreation dump truck vehicles never to be seen again. This is unlawful and unacceptable. The daily police and sheriff altercations and destruction of people's property is a self-sustaining cycle that perpetuates the harmful circumstances and trauma disorders of the homeless people. Witnesses report that the police do not listen to the homeless people's pleas for visible specific survival items. Police can be heard threatening arrest throughout the process, making people feel criminalized and terrified. Witnesses report recently watching the police throw away a 40-pound bag of dog food as the dog owner begged to be able to take it with her. Seizure and destruction of medicine is common and can be life-threatening. One way to comply with the law is to not take property in the first place. This would also be cheaper. The public health goals of the camp cleanup programs are not being met. We think it can be done better, cheaper, and get closer to solving the problem. Studies of sweeps found that of the 174 camps removed by the LAPD last year, everyone has returned. The solution is, that is being employed is not solving the problem. The city has put fences around public parts that keep everybody out. The violent language and shock of the sweeps affect the most vulnerable in an already vulnerable population, increasing symptoms of PTSD and panic disorders. It is well documented that veterans in this population are especially likely to suffer from these conditions. The daily sweeps of Coral Street starting June 3rd were predated by a city eviction notice of only five days. With physical disabilities, even two weeks is often not enough, and five days is horrific. Forcing disabled homeless people to move off of Coral Street is short-sighted and harmful. Many people with illnesses or chronic conditions will likely miss appointments and postpone care. Thank you. Person online, good afternoon. Hello, Very good. Next person in line, good afternoon. Welcome. Um, I'd like to continue the reading of the letter for the Mental Health Advisory Board. Um, um, people with illnesses or chronic conditions will likely miss appointments and postpone care due to much further displaced or distance to travel to access homeless persons, health project, HPHP, or the showers of housing matters. This ultimately can increase the severity of their conditions and keeps them unhoused and dependent on county-funded nonprofit services longer. Supporters of the police removal of the camps cite spreading diseases as a common concern, HIV, lung disease, skin infections, as well as mental health issues 
afflict this demographic in higher numbers than the general population. This, will force, this is why forced migration is so dangerous. Forcing people to move further away from the resources offered by HPHP can increase spread of contagious diseases and seems to be in complete opposition to the stated health concerns of the county. We need to prioritize public health. Tents, bedding, tarps, food, clothes, shoes, water bottles, backpacks, chargers, phones, cleaning supplies, bikes, mobility aids, medicines, propane tanks, portable batteries, coolers, laptops, art materials, family memorabilia, pet food, even IDs, birth certificates, and identification papers are destroyed, making it even more impossible to seek services in the county. Some of these items are hard to acquire, and some are the most basic tools needed to get out of survival out of survival camps and off the assisted programs. The cycles of property seizure and destruction makes it extremely difficult for homeless people to maintain stability, required to keep in touch with employment, family, doctors, development routines, sleep, eat, and ultimately survive when living without shelter and everything is destroyed over and over again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next person in line. Good afternoon. Welcome. I will be finishing the letter from the Mental Health Advisory Board. Recent, recent statistics from behavioral health indicate that on average 43% of the people they serve are unhoused, but this is likely an understatement due to the exclusion of co contract services. In this county alone, we have witnessed the loss of homes to fires and floods, and we do not know when an earthquake may cause more loss. In addition, the economic downturn, especially in local tech industries, plus the exorbitant cost of reasonable housing in this area, should give us pause to consider that no one is immune to losing their home. About 15,000 people are becoming homeless each week in the U.S. now. We suggest that a more compassionate and sustainable plan will not only help homeless people now, but could build a better infrastructure of resources and support. This method of police action against encampments is not working. With national attention on the homeless crisis, here in Santa Cruz County, we have an opportunity to implement solutions that work. Current practices are not bringing solutions. They're exacerbating the problem. Undeniably, there is a need for safety, trash removal, and walkability all over the county. Let us all work together to navigate a new solution that prioritizes health and allocates funding to help not punish homeless people, including senior citizens and veterans. And I will now move to a journal the American Medical Association study that covered uh, forced displacement of unhoused people and found that, quote, continual involuntary displacement may contribute to between 15.6 and 24.4% 20 of additional deaths among unsheltered people experiencing homelessness who inject drugs over a 10-year period. These policies of displacement are killing people. They are worsening a health crisis police response, they have nowhere to go, police response is not a solution, and in addition, the theft of, the seizure of property will drive petty theft and only worsen crime in the area. Thank you for being here. Next person, good afternoon, welcome. Hello all, my name is Dora. I'm a molecular ecologist working at the university. I'm here to comment on the harmfulness of the homeless encampment sweeps in the city. I have attended many of these sweeps where people's belongings are destroyed by bulldozers and shoveled into dumpsters. We are told often that they are for the sake of health and safety, that the encampments are unsanitary. As you may know, there was a Shigella outbreak, a potentially life-threatening disease that causes dysentery symptoms spread by unclean water. Uh, at Harvey West at the time, the, where an encampment had formed, the city shut off the water. You don't have to be a biologist to understand that actions like that only spread disease and threaten lives. The city also seems to throw away perfectly sanitary items for the sake of health and safety. One man who lost his house due to fire told me how city workers took his still new and plastic wrapped survival gear given to him by FEMA and destroyed it, claiming it was unsanitary and dangerous. On top of that, throwing away people's belongings destroys their medicine, forced relocation aggravates chronic or acute conditions, and sweeping areas like Coral Street forces people to move further from vital medical aid like HPHP. If the sweeps are being done for the sake of health and safety, it certainly doesn't seem to be for the health of homeless people. We are also often told that encampments are swept for the sake of the environment. At the Poganip open spaces, I have witnessed bulldozers plowing down wide paths into the meadows and forests to destroy encampments, doing obviously more damage than a small encampment. 
I have found large piles of crushed and destroyed belongings left behind, many of which seem not to get cleaned up. As an ecologist, I can say confidently that the way we are currently addressing encampments is harming, not protecting our ecology. If we can use nature for recreation, we should also be able to use it for survival. And simple measures like regularly serviced trash cans and bathrooms would be cheaper and more effective than mechanized sweeps. It is clear that these sweeps are not addressing health or our environment properly, and it is also clear to me that encampments reform immediately after sweeps, just with more traumatized inhabitants. This is a stupid and wasteful cycle. We all know there's a better way to address these encampments. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Afternoon. Um, I'm Greg Bengston, a uh, registered voter of Santa Cruz, and currently living in the streets, but uh, planning on heading back into apartment land very soon. Um, it's no no fun out there. I haven't been swept, um, but I do see uh, uh, some major effects on on people, particularly those who are uh, vulnerable or are already uh, experiencing uh, psychiatric symptoms. Uh, it's getting crazy out there. Um, of course, that's a, a broader issue, um, but I just wish that it was taken into consideration that I, I do see people really being negatively impacted. Um, uh, as far as property, it gets down to the nitty gritty of what should be survival gear, et cetera, and, and saved, and, and then what legitimately is abandoned. Uh, I just wish that most of my property wasn't just disappearing uh, to my fellow homeless uh, people. I, uh, I, but we need to give a better example um, from how the police in the city uh, take care of property, and uh, maybe um, my friends would uh, follow suit. Um, there's a lot of things that we do need to do on our behavior side, both how we affect the environment um, and just our behavior along the levee, blocking bikes and stuff. But it's hard for me to make a, a plea to my friends, and I do, but um, uh, when they do see uh, city, city and uh, police uh, behavior, at times, uh, kind of going against what policy is or stated policy, and uh, let's just all try to work on things and, and be, con be conscious of those people that are very, very vulnerable and how they're getting kind of squished in, in, the, in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, members of the council. My name is Troy Mason. Um, I have been homeless pretty much since I got here. Um, I see a lot of people are very mean here to, be, to homeless people. Um, I have ideas. I have an idea uh, to erect a monument in honor of the homeless Americans who died here and maybe even uh, California. But I was just in San Francisco, and I, watched, I went to that um, art museum, that monolith, that gorgeous structure with the angels inside of it. And I was thinking, you know, Santa Cruz could be a pillar of light and hope for the whole world. A lot of tourists come here, and this monument, if shot a beam of light, was up way up on the mountain, and had their names engraved. I have a complete schematic, but... It would bring more people here from all over the world. It would show the world that we know how to treat our own because we're, we're Santa Cruzians, man. We love this place just as much as you all do. And I'm not trying to destroy it, but there's a lot of people out there that don't care, that don't have American values and, and morals. And we, the ones of us that do, we got to deal with that. And then they're trying to make us victims and do hor horrible things to us, on, too. So I just think that we should just, if it's upside down, turn it around, man. We got to start telling people to love your neighbor and to love each other because we could really be a shining light. And I think that's what we should do. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. I brought some extra copies of this very long paper. I welcome you guys back after your summer vacation, summer session. And I'd like to catch you up. So on June 3rd, I don't know if you guys left at that point, but on June 3rd, started the Coral Street sweeps. On July 29th was the Poganeep sweeps, and on May 28th was the sweeps on Harvey West after the water was shut down after a Shigella outbreak. That is an extreme problem, and I'm still trying to follow up with the water department for why. There are several issues with how we treat our homeless people, but most acutely, I have noticed that the issue is property destruction. There are several laws that say that property should be kept, both civil 
Code 2080, the Camping Ordinance 636, and Gavin Newsom's nearest executive order on July 25th all say that valuable property that is taken by any state or city employee should be stored for 60 to 90 days, and this is not occurring. I recently at the Poganip marked a wheelchair with a note saying this is valuable medical equipment, please store for Huff. I then called and called and I've spoken to several officers and the property department of the police station and they did not save any of the equipment that we marked with medical equipment and they didn't save the wheelchair either. They didn't save the tents. All of this is things that are supposed to be saved by the camping ordinance and by civil code 2080. SCPD is regularly the issue. They are threatening arrest. They are using rude language. Sergeant Ross, Officer Kerr, Officer Kaufman are some of the three rudest people I've seen who have made fun of homeless people and directly to their face aggressively called them liars. I recently watched them try to take away my friend's dog who he's had for decades and called him a liar when he said that was my dog. That's my dog. And they said, you're a liar. And they tried to take him away. And only when a random person came up that wasn't homeless and pointed out that he was telling the truth, then they listened to them. That is dehumanization, and it is a crucial issue. Thank you. Next person in line. Good afternoon. Yeah, yes, hello. Before I identify myself, I'd like to question a point of order. Yes. Last time, third time that Garrett mentioned it, his two minutes got changed to three minutes. What's going on say, with that? I'm sorry, say it again. We are usually given three minutes to make public comments and comment on things, and on the 25th of June, the third time that Garrett spoke at about 58 minutes, you guys changed the two minutes to three minutes, part of your public record. So everybody should be getting three minutes. I would like three minutes. You can have two minutes, because that's what it says on our agenda today, and I will you know, take a look at that uh, for okay, our next. Fine. Uh, excuse me, we don't talk over each other. I didn't talk over you. You're not going to do it over me. So now I'm going to respond to you. You have two minutes today. I will take a look at the issue, and I will respond next week, next time the council's in session as to our protocol. But please proceed with your two minutes. Pardon me for speaking over you. It wasn't my intention. I appreciate the clarity. Very good. Thank you. And we'll find more clarity. There we go. So, gee, while everybody was on vacation, there sure have been a lot of things going on. I'm certainly going to talk about some information I found out firsthand diagonally across the street at Pound Planned Parenthood. You know, nobody needs to believe a word I... Timer. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I guess I identify as the handsome devil party. So, um, monkey, talk, monkey pox was first uh, patented in 1997. So there's a lot of scams going on with the World Homicide Organization about that right now. <laughs> You know, we did have a fake political assassination. That was pretty wild. What I think is even weirder is the Skull and Bones Republican, J.D. Vance, that um, what's interesting about that gentleman is all the Democrats seem to like him. I wonder why. So what else is really going on? We had a $277 billion sale-off by Warren Buffett that caused a $4 trillion loss in the stock market, which is really with derivatives banking is over a $40, billion, $40 trillion loss. What else is going on? Anybody can look into some video presentations or read the book, The Great Taking, by David Rogers Webb. It really describes what's going on. So I don't really follow fake stream news that often, but I sometimes I do. And I was watching Gutfield last Wednesday night, and there were four professional male athletes, two professional male athletes that were both talking about how detrimental taking estrogen, excuse me, pardon me, taking testosterone is for men. And then they mentioned that Planned Parenthood is giving testosterone to young women. I went in there on Friday, I was polite. I asked for some paperwork on that, they couldn't provide it. I asked for information on their website, they couldn't provide it. But they didn't deny that that's happening. So I guess that's enough for now, keeping confidentiality and stuff. This isn't mine. This thank is. You. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Ewing. Thank you. Good afternoon. Next person in line. Next person in line. Good afternoon. I'm. 
My name is Catherine Travers, and I live at the uh, St. George Hotel. Um, I couldn't see on the agenda if uh, there was going to be anything brought up about the rent increases. Is there? There is not on today's agenda, so your oral communication is in order. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I don't really know what to say because I didn't prepare anything, but I didn't. I, I, I arrived thinking that other more knowledgeable people were going to be here, but uh, it seems like me and my partner are the only ones here. Um, there's, I don't know how many people live there, close to 200, I think. Um, we have been living there 13 years, and we've had one, uh, one um, rent increase in that time, and uh, we're going from $1,000 a month for one uh, studio apartment to 1600 a month in November. So that's like a 60% increase, and I'm going to reference the state bill 1482, I believe it's called 1482, that was in 2019 saying that uh, rent increases couldn't be more than 10% a year. Um, and I know that the, the, the management um, that I believe is, um, is it <laughs> um, there, it, there's a, um, I can't remember the name of the management. Um, they have switched, uh, mm -hmm. Companies, they say they have sold it, but uh, I believe it's more been of an inheritance the, from father to daughter. And anyways, Let me just say this. Uh, we don't typically respond during oral commission. I, I do want to let you know we are, oh, well, shall we say, we have received a fair amount of correspondence okay, on this. Okay. There is work being done inside the city government to understand this issue and its complexities. Don't be surprised if this appears at some point on a future agenda. So, okay. uh, I, I, yeah. but thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you Next person in line. Hello, how are you, sir? Good to see you again. Turned on channel 25, you were on. I'm like, ah! Anyway, <laughs> I'm here to talk about this, like, you know, what's going on with the homeless, the, it's encampment craziness and stuff. It's like um, when the Supreme Court did this crazy thing they did, I called the chief. You know, you go there and you can't get an appointment with him straight up. So I called him and he called me back and I talked to him because, I, I mean, I'm just so concerned. It don't make sense to me. I mean, it's like um, where do we put the homeless if there's nowhere to put them? I mean, is there internment camps? Is it? Holocaust time again already? Learn anything? Is there any protections? The city, y'all, our people, our folks, any protections for what's happening out there? This is real, it's reality. Nowhere to go? What, what? The, what little they got? I'm hearing that they're throwing it away. I talked to the chief, I asked him, he said he wasn't doing that kind of activity, so if I, they are doing that kind of, do the city, do they oversee them, watch them, give them instructions? Do they listen? Can they follow your guidance? If your folks need you, we need you now. I know you all know what reality is. Can somebody help somebody in this world? It's only getting worse. What up? Who's next? You? I don't know if you can hear me or feel me yet. But I'm saying, if there's some protection, can we get some now? Show them. Pump your chest up. Do like we do, because we got to walk these streets every day. What up? Help us. Help. Help yourself. Help this world. Save somebody something. It's real. I know y'all know. We are we are now at uh, just a little bit past. I don't think there's anybody else who wants to address us or, or communication. Anybody online, Ms. Push? 
Thank you all very much. We are on statements of disqualifications. Does a council member, any council members need to make such statements? Seeing hearing none, additions and deletions to the agenda. Ms. Bush, do we have any additions or deletions? No, we don't. Thank you. City Attorney report on closed session, sir. Yes, thank you, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. There are four items on uh, this afternoon's closed session. First item was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims. Those are the claims of Viet Huang Vo and Geico Insurance Company. Uh, those items are also listed on your afternoon consent calendar for council action. Second item was real property negotiations. The council received a report from its real property negotiator uh, concerning city-owned property at 37 Municipal Wharf. Third item was a conference with legal counsel um, involving council initiation of litigation or potential initiation of litigation. Um, fourth item was a conference with legal counsel uh, concerning significant exposure to litigation. There was one item discussed under that category, and there was no reportable action on any of those items. Thank you, sir. We are on item five, council meeting agenda. Uh, Ms. Bush, is there anything you would like to draw to our attention? No, there are no changes. Thank you so much. We are on the consent agenda. This is, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with it, we will be taking up items six through 29, inclusive on one vote. What we will do is I will go around the dais and see if there's anyone who wishes to pull an item, comment on an item, or ask a question. I am now going to begin with Council Member Newsom. Council Member. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have a, uh, just comments on items 16, 17, 21, and 24. Please provide those now. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to see each of these items on our agenda. Uh, they each deal with infrastructure improvements in my district that are vitally needed. Uh, item 16 in particular deals with the completion of the Main Street or the Main Beach uh, bathroom renovation project. I want to thank Director Elliott and Planner Downing for their fine work on this much needed project uh, and for completing the project in time for community members and visitors uh, to enjoy during summer months. I also want to thank Director Elliott and his team for item 17. As we know, uh, the wharf is an iconic and cherished asset in our community that was damaged by storms er earlier this year. Uh, so I'm happy to see uh, that we are getting to work um, repairing the wharf so that our can community uh, can enjoy a bit more. And finally, uh, item 21 and item 24 will improve bicycle safety in my district through providing a protective uh, bike lane on Bay Street, as is the case with item 21, and at the roundabout where Pacific Avenue and Beach Street meet, as is the case with item 24. Uh, this is much needed work in my district, and that will improve safety uh, in our community. And I want to thank Public Works Director Nguyen, uh, Transportation uh, Planner Gallagly, and Transportation Manager Starkey for bringing each item forward. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Council Member Brown is recognized on the consent agenda. I have a couple of comments on item 18, mm -hmm. which is the um, uh, contract for cleanup of encampments in the Pogo Nip. Uh, I am particularly concerned uh, about this item in large part because of what we heard during oral communications about the experience of people who are um, being swept from these encampments <clears throat> and the loss of property. So I want to ask a question about that. I'm not going to ask for folks to respond right now, but I want you all to know, those of you who came, um, that I hear you. Um, and I, too, have uh, had experiences where, where I've recently encountered people who tell me that their, for example, medications have been taken and with a bat when their things were taken during a clearance of an encampment. Um, you know, for a city that is, uh, you know, doing things that we um, hope are going to be contributing to uh, improved health and safety for all in our community, uh, and um, that is, has taken uh, significant role in responding to the needs and the, the challenges uh, associated with our unhoused population, I think we have a responsibility to um, ensure that people are not um, losing their, you know, in some cases, really critical belongings. I mean, identification, medication, those are the things in, you know, I mean, obviously other things as well, and the trauma that people experience 
And I fear that uh, we are going to be heading back into the days of just pushing people around, confiscating their belongings, and um, with, with no recourse for those folks, and in immeasurable trauma. So I'm, I'm going to be voting no on that, this item. Um, I'm not going to try to convince anyone to, <laughs> to oppose it, um, because I do understand that there is a need for um, management of our open spaces. And I'm very concerned about people living in, you know, long term in those open spaces. We have fire danger. Um, but it comes as a result of pushing people around. And I've been consistent during my time on the council. I, most of my time on the council has been in the context of uh, is, you know, a, a court ruling that was just recently overturned, and I just, um, I just can't express how concerned I am about what people are going to experience, and I don't think it benefits our community as a whole to have more traumatized people just going back out onto the streets without their medication, without identification, without the ability to do the things they need to do to, to get out of the situation. So I'm going to be voting no on this item, and I will be following up. Um, Laura, I know how to reach you. If other folks, um, uh, hopefully you can connect through Laura, um, because I am very concerned, and um, you know I just I don't think that, and, and we have policies about that. So if we're violating our own policies, then we really need to be taking a step back and looking at what at that. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. We are uh, Councilmember Watkins is recognized. I don't have any comments on things. The vice mayor is recognized. Um. I would like to say thank you to Public Works for item, I believe it was 21, um, and for item, and that's the protected bike lanes, the stop sign at Bay, or um, excuse me, 24 and Seaside. That's been a dangerous intersection, especially since the Starbucks has been added to that corner. And item 27, the um, Westcliff Drive stabilization. Um, I would like to comment again also on the Poganip Nature Loop Encampment Cleanup. Um, and perhaps you haven't been out there to see the dangerous conditions, but the people that are living out there are being victimized themselves by um, other people out there. And so it's not safe for people to live in encampments. And so I support the encampment cleanup. And we, it's our responsibility to ensure that um, our protected nature areas are protected for everyone and the waterways are protected as it feeds into the um, tributaries feed into the San Lorenzo River, which is our water source. So thank you for that cleanup effort. Councilmember Kalantar Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Um, I will also quickly comment on item 18 and then also 21, 24, 26, 27. I'll make them brief. Um, item 18, um, I just want to acknowledge that um, every single person that we encounter at an encampment is offered shelter. And um, we spend over $8 million in our community. Excuse that me. That's false. That's excuse, fine. Excuse, excuse me. Fine. But that's false. Please remove the lady from the king chambers. That's false. We spend over $8 million. Excuse me. Excuse me. The council member is now recognized. The council member is now recognized. Thank you. Um, so thank you to this council for approving a homelessness response framework that invests over $8 million to support folks through shelter. No other city in this community um, or our county board of supervisors is investing in that way. Um, items 21, 24, and 26, I also just want to acknowledge and thank our public works uh, team and our transportation team for improving um, pedestrian bike safety. And item 27, um, just um, how incredible of a work that we've done to quickly stabilize Westcliff and make sa Westcliff safe for residents and visitors. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. You had uh, those cover all of your items that you wish to thank you very much. Council Member Bruner is recognized. Thank you. I had a comment on 18 and um, Item number 18. I just lost it.
Um, item 12 and item 18. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, item 12 is the California Ocean Protection Council grant um, regarding grant funds to develop a resilient coast Santa Cruz shoreline adoption adaptation blueprint. And um, um, this follows a lot of the um, uh, work that our um, climate action plan and greenhouse gas um, reduction efforts. And so I'm really um, happy to see this grant program and um, um, really support that. Thank you. Um, item 18 um, is the Pogan Pogan up Nature Loop Trail Encampment Cleanup Contract. And this is um, cleanup work um, and an authorization of funds to for that cleanup in that area. And in light of um, you know what what uh, we've had come before us in oral communications, um, I just I think we have um, um, a need to really show and communicate and um, somehow, and I'm, I'm asking the city manager to, as we move forward, to really um, make sure um, our homelessness response team, we have um, our director of that, and I know that there are staff members from each department um, that um, coordinate on these efforts and to really maybe document and show in photos and videos there's a concern in the community and their statements being made and um, you know the information that we get um, doesn't show violations and the pictures I see shows um, it doesn't look like um, belonging so I you know I hope that that it's looked into and um, um, that maybe photos and video are um, a good way to go going forward um, as it's documented. And I know that is done to some degree, but I think it's really important we do have to um, clean up any environmental hazards and fire risks. That is our um, responsibility. Um, but we also have a responsibility to people, and I know our efforts have been really um, geared at people first, and um, so let's make sure that this um, difference and conflict is addressed and that we're doing our best to um, support going forward. Um, thank you. Thank you. This is an opportunity for the public to comment upon any of the items on the consent agenda, excluding number 18, if you testified essentially on that earlier uh, regarding homeless issues. Anyone on, on this, on the consent agenda, exclusive of item 18, if you've already testified? Good afternoon. Yes, I'd like to bring attention to a point of order again. I was Please, correct, Please, whereas sir. on June 25th, Garrett did speak at about a few seconds after 58 minutes where you changed his two minutes to three minutes because he was saying the subject he wanted to talk about, which I want to talk about too, had to do with the leaf blower issue. So I'm hoping that everybody, if they want to, has three minutes each to talk about the consent agenda items because I'd like to talk about number seven, which is the minutes, and number 18, the Pogano, please. Please proceed for two minutes. One can only try, can they? That's right. And you do a very good job of it, Mr. I Ewing. I appreciate thank you. that. So, um, okay, first of all, I really want to thank the clerks. They are the historians. I didn't have a complete time to look at all the minutes and the notes that you took, but I like some of the things you said. Thank you very much. Um, what brought me in here more than five years ago is why are we allowing military frequency weapons in civilian locations. On that note, we are all homeless. I've been recorded several times, sometimes for over an hour talking about these issues. But um, somebody did a short film for Keith McHenry, 
when I said the homeless people that are seem to be getting by as well as they can, some of them are full-time college students, they have full-time jobs, and they have two or three children, and they're still making by with less. We are all, how much time do I have? We are all homeless because of these frequency weapons. Because your home is supposed to be safe, it's supposed to be private. And with these frequency weapons, it is not. I guess that's enough for now. Thank you, Mr. Thank Keeley. you, Mr. Ewing. Anyone else on the consent agenda? Seeing and hearing none, matters back before the body. You know, let me, hold on just a second. We don't, no, excuse me. We don't accept people standing up and shouting. If you want to raise a point of order, you come to the dais, you raise a point of order. I've already explained this. We are on the consent agenda, accepting comment, except on item 18, if you essentially testified on it during oral communication. Do you wish to testify on an item other than 18? Yeah, not 18. testified not on 18. it already? No, okay. Uh, I, was, I, was, I, was, uh, I was led to believe we were going from 6 to 29, just from... What is the this? item you wish to testify on? Uh, the war for Paris. Please proceed. Thank you. Air Ms. Fred. Bush, this is two minutes, not three minutes. Okay, I'll Please take proceed. I'll take a buck and a half. How about that? Um, I uh, I just want to talk about when I worked out at the Dolphin at the end of the wharf. Uh, it was long after Phil's, uh, you know, was gone, and you know you could buy beverages out there, uh, you know, not not real, you know, not real uh, Disneyland type prices, you know, just a um, a soda pop, right? And um, feel like you're a little closer to Hawaii out there on the end of the wharf. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the damage done, you know, certainly uh, it's pretty significant. Um, uh, I, uh, I, f I feel like, I feel like uh, uh, the end of the wharf is a very special place. And the damage, um, I guess you're, uh, let's see, I guess, uh, sorry to not be prepared here. Well, anyways, the wharf repair, yeah, the wharf repair, I think it should uh, be sensitive to the fact that, uh, yeah, having a, having a restaurant at the end of the wharf is, uh, is uh, you know, is essentially a benefit to the community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else on the consent agenda? Seeing near none, the matter is back before the body. Is there a motion? So moved. On the There's consent. a motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second by well, Councilmember Gallantari Johnson? Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? I, with the exception of item 18. Uh, Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. The consent well, agenda is approved. I did, sorry, you skipped over. Oh, oh my gosh, That's I'm okay. so sorry. Councilmember Calentari Johnson? Aye. There we Vice go. Mayor Golder, Mayor Keeley. Aye. Thank you very much. We are on item 30. This is. This is a municipal code amendment to historic variations responding to modification requested by the California Coastal Commission. We have members of the planning department representing that department who will provide opening statements. A nice good afternoon. Welcome. Hope you had a wonderful summer. Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, council members. We actually don't have a staff presentation today. This is a very brief technical item. We are available to answer any questions. Are there questions by council members? This will be the opportunity. Council Member Brown? No? Council, council member questions. Seeing and hearing none, this will be the opportunity for anyone who's with us today to comment on item 20. 30, rather, excuse me, item 30. Anyone online? Seeing and hearing none, matters back before the body. We'll move the staff recommendation. Motion by Council Member Brown, second by the Vice Mayor. <laughs> Further debate or discussion, seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Brenner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item 31, an ordinance to streamline permitting and establish standards for private property outdoor seating associated with eating and or drinking establishments. We have staff presentations. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Ms. Stanger, will you be opening on this? I will. Ms. Unit. Who Thank is? I, I will be starting the presentation and Thank Ms. You. Unit will be uh, finishing. Um, thank you very much, Mayor and City Council members. 
Um, so can we not have the first slide, please? Thank you very much. Okay, so this is the item on private property outdoor seating for our eating and drinking establishments. That's restaurants, bars, brew pubs, et cetera. Um, this is with the subcommittee on outdoor seating um, with council members Bruner, Newsom, and Kalantari Johnson, um, as well as staff from the Economic Development and Housing Department and the Planning and Community Development Department. So, click our. So um, as some background, um, uh, restaurants and bars had um, temporary outdoor seating areas set up during COVID um, when the indoor spaces were closed. They were set up through a temporary emergency permit program. Um, these permits have been extended a number of times um, while the subcommittee and staff were exploring some more permanent um, ways to facilitate um, allowing these spaces to become permanent. Um, so they're currently, these um, permits are currently extended through May of 2025. There are 22 businesses that hold active temporary permits. Uh, many of these businesses have expressed an interest in becoming um, permanent um, and So um, the subcommittee and staff have done a lot of work in the last year. We've had seven, uh, might actually be eight now, subcommittee meetings um, from June of 2023 um, through July 2024. Um, we've had three community outreach meetings. In September of 2023, we had an outreach meeting specifically with the businesses and then another one with the general public. Um, and we also conducted a survey. Um, and then we've had four public hearings, which were um, two planning commission hearings in April and June. And now um, in August, we will be having two city council hearings. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the existing process. So there is a way for these businesses to establish outdoor patios right now. Um, they would require approval of an administrative use permit and a design permit um, if the establishment has a non-conforming alcohol um, service use, which means that um, their alcohol use predates the requirements of our alcohol use ordinance, um, and they expand their alcohol use, then that would require approval of a special use permit. Um, a, an administrative use and design permit costs over $7,000 and takes three months at least from the date of application to the date of approval at a public hearing um, with the zoning administrator. A special use permit would go to the planning commission. After that, they would need to obtain a building permit. The cost of the building permit is based on the valuation of the project. Um, and is three weeks for the first review and two weeks for subsequent reviews. So um, the subcommittee and staff worked to explore some options to reduce permit costs. And we initially developed a more streamlined process. And um, we presented this process to um, the public and to the restaurants in September of last year. And we received a lot of feedback. Based on that feedback that we heard during that outreach, we worked hard to create an even more streamlined process. And that is what we are presenting now. So this process completely eliminates the planning permit, so there's no use permit or design permit. Um, and that reduces permit fees by over $7,000. It removes at least three months from the entire permitting timeline for these businesses. Um, and under the process, all that is required is a building permit as long as the patio is fully consistent with the proposed design and operational standards. And I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Rebecca. Okay, thank you. Um, 
So under this revised process, um, we're also taking it a step further in creating sort of uh, administrative streamlining as well by splitting up the building permit options into an hourly review process and a standard review process. So um, in this case, if a business has an outdoor seating area that's 300 square feet or less um, and does not have any permanent structures, they could go through an hourly review um, and that is, uh, the building fees for that are typically $142 per hour, and we're trying to do a one-week turnaround on that, um, accounting for about one to two hours of staff review and the rest of that time um, being the processing to get those permits issued. Under the standard review process, that would be um, anyone that's wanting to put up a patio cover or um, have other permanent structures like that, large umbrellas that need to be anchored to the ground, for example, or larger than 300 square foot of space. That goes through our traditional standard building permit review process. Um, those permits are based on valuation of the project. Uh, and those typically have a three-week turnaround for a first round of review. Um, if there's comments and changes required, that goes through additional reviews. Um, but just to give an idea of that initial timeline. Uh, so to go through a little bit more on um, how this process um, improves and streamlines uh, this review, um, outdoor seating would now be considered allowed by right, so we don't have those use permit requirements. Um, businesses would only be required to uh, follow the operating standards and design standards um, that are set out in the ordinance. Um, they would also be allowed to deviate from those if they wanted to. Um, they would have to go through the use permit or design permit process for that, um, but we did want to give some flexibility to still allow that um, if it was needed. Uh, another big change from this is that we're not requiring um, parking to be replaced as part of um, outdoor seating. So a lot of these spaces are set up in businesses, um, private parking lots. And so um, wanting to be able to allow that space to continue to be used for outdoor seating. Um, there is still a requirement to provide replacement uh, bicycle parking. Uh, so we do know that you know folks will still need to get there. And so we want to provide um, adequate space for alternative transportation options. Uh, building permit is always required um, for any private developments. So that's not something that we're able to remove in this case, um, but this is really uh, as, as streamlined as we could um, whittle this down. And then again, as I stated, being able to provide those two levels of review to try to create um, some additional uh, easier pathways for businesses. Oops. Uh, let's see. So uh, for a business uh, to consider this, their next steps would be um, to determine sort of the size that they want to use for their outdoor seating area and then have that path. If they're looking at the um, 300 square foot or less option, um, they could do a hand-drawn site plan. We we're keeping that threshold really low um, just to be able to get that approval um, at a, a really quick pace. And then over 300 square feet would go through our standard review process of requiring um, plans developed by a licensed uh, design professional and submitted to building for that review. Uh, so just a little bit more background on sort of how we came to this proposed uh, process. We, um, following the feedback that we received uh, in September of 2023, we did additional surveys of cities that are um, taking on this effort. There's not too many um, in the state of California that we found, but we were able to find 14 other cities. Um, of those 13 still have some sort of discretionary permit requirement. Uh, the city that we're really basing our proposal on um, is the city of San Diego, which is the only other jurisdiction we were able to find in our research that um, requires a building permit only. Uh, and then uh, some of the discussions that we had had uh, early on in this process was, do we want to treat proximity to residential differently, have some different hours of operation? Um, and so the cities of San Jose and San Diego do have some different restrictions within um, certain distances of residential in terms of their hours of operation uh, and discussions with the subcommittee and businesses we decided to not um, pursue that option but that is just something that we did explore through this uh, and then locally the other jurisdictions in our county still have discretionary permits um, ours is really the most streamlined uh, locally uh, within our other jurisdictions Okay, and then uh, this did get uh, approved at Planning Commission um, in June. So this is uh, their recommendations were to approve the ordinance changes. Um, they also had a recommendation that the City Council consider providing additional time to businesses to move into um, permanence. So as part of that, we have prepared an extension to our temporary ordinance to expire on July uh, 1st, 2026. 
Uh, this aligns with some alcohol um, or alcohol license approvals at the state level um, that were passed during COVID. Um, so just sort of ties up with that um, move to permanency there. Um, they also requested a definition for the term low volume in the operating standards um, and specify that temporary restrooms, if used during remodels, have hand washing stations. So we provided that uh, definition and um, those are our, the hand washing stations are already required. So that was, um, that was settled. And then the final um, recommendation was that the city council subcommittee consider um, reaching out to state representatives to advocate for more streamlined regulations around outdoor seating at the state level. And so one of our recommendations uh, for you today is to have um, the building official help prepare a letter to um, state representatives that the mayor can send if you wish. And then our staff report recommendations are here. I won't read them for you, but um, would welcome any questions and comments from here. Well, thank you very much. Let me see if there are questions or comments by council members. Uh, as you're teeing this up, let me thank the subcommittee of the council for very good work on this. The vice mayor is recognized. Again, I thank everybody for all your hard work on this. I think the outdoor dining um, is one of the silver linings that's come out of the pandemic. It's really exciting to see these barriers removed where um, it's already really expensive to operate a um, restaurant or dining establishment in this town. And you know, so this is really, really awesome. The only question I have, and you, you had a slide up there with the different the different places. I had one question about one where they have out, it's I think Humble Sea, it's on uh, Swift Street. They have outdoor dining in their parking lot, but they also have something that goes out into almost the bike lane. And it's it seems almost dangerous because the way people are coming around the rail trail right there. And so it's like they already have a huge amount of outdoor dining. And so then that's the only one where it's just like, I see the, the point of taking away the parking spaces. And I don't know if those were previously parking spaces, but to me, it seems like, bike lane is being taken and that to me seems dangerous and maybe I'm perceiving it wrong but I've seen a lot of near misses there okay that's great feedback to hear and we can certainly uh, follow up on that so that space is actually under our parklet program so the outdoor seating on public property um, they do have a permit for it but we can certainly uh, take a look and make sure that there's adequate you know signage and um, yeah and distance yeah, it's super and activated that, so. which is great I just don't want anyone to yeah. get hurt The questions, comments, council members? Well, I'll make my comment after. Certainly. For the questions? No question. I just have a comment. Okay. Uh, if I might uh, ask a couple of quick questions. Um, and, and the colleagues who served on the subcommittee, thank you for all of your very fine work on that. Let me ask a couple of questions about parking. Will you put the parking slide back up for a second? Thank you. Whoa. <laughs> Wishful thinking, yes. <laughs> and again. It's okay. Let's do it this way. Let me just ask you about it. Don't worry about it. Um, I, do our friends at the Coastal Commission get involved in this? Would you explain how? Um, they do get involved um, for the, um, basically the locations that are in the coastal zone. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, it's a little more nuanced than that. So there's a state law that says that um, if you're within a half mile of a transit district, then um, you don't have to provide parking in most cases. And most of the city is within a half mile of a transit district. There are some portions that are not within half mile of a transit district. So, um, so there is still a required parking for these establishments. A few of that, a few of those establishments are in the coastal zone, and that is um, the establishments at the southern end of Seabright. Okay. Can you speak a little more? I'm sorry. The, the, the businesses at the southern end of Seabright by Seabright and Murray, there's a handful of businesses that have outdoor dining spaces. Those are outside a half mile of a transit district. Or I'm sorry, half mile of a, of a, a, major, a major bus stop. I'm sorry. Um, and so they still have a parking requirement. They are also in the coastal zone. So these um, regulations in the proposed ordinance, once approved by the city, 
would then go to the Coastal Commission for approval, and the Coastal Commission um, would would need to approve that we are no longer requiring those parking spaces to be replaced if they are removed in order to create an outdoor dining patio. Are there any limits on the number of applications we could receive and process? We don't have a limit on that. Say it again? We do not have a limit on that. We do not have a limit. So as applicants come in, we'll be processing those. We'll do it in the context of our ordinance, right? Correct. Okay. And we do not have policy with, it is a question, not a statement. Uh, we do not have policy with regard to the removal of parking. So in the proposed ordinance for, for required parking spaces that are removed, they need to be replaced with additional bicycle parking. Um, and that will be at a ratio of six bicycle parking spaces per automobile parking space removed. And that's consistent with our parking ordinance um, for, um, for um, um, locations that want to remove required parking. They can do, anyone can do that um, up to a certain percentage. Um, or, they, or the establishment could participate in the city's non-automobile program, which includes um, things like provision of bus passes to employees and other incentives for alternative transportation. What is the lens through which the Coastal Commission will review this ordinance? What is the Coastal Commission jurisdiction through which they will evaluate our ordinance? Well, mostly, well, they look through it through the view of the Coastal Act. I and, understand, but right. uh, can so, we get more specific than that? So specifically, I think their concern would be coastal access and specifically um, the provision of public parking to access the coast. Um, so that's how they would be looking at well, that, whether found... removal of these parking spaces on private property could affect that. Um, I'm interested in the, in the parking that's in the public right away. That's, that's the parking I'm interested in because it seems to me over the years the Coastal Commission's, shall we say, reluctant to approve anything that reduces access to the coast and public parking in our city is one of those issues. I like this program a lot. I'm trying to anticipate what it is we're going to be dealing with at the Coastal Commission and what legal standard they're going to apply in reviewing our ordinance. So do we have a sense of we communicated with the Coastal Commission and gotten a sense from their staff how they're going to review this? And again, I'd like to see if I can understand the lens through which they will be evaluating this. Uh, we have spoken with Coastal Commission staff um, and they looked at the number of spaces that could potentially be removed and um, how that could impact the public parking in that neighborhood. Um, and based on that conversation we had, they expressed that they felt comfortable with what we were proposing. And on a going forward basis, uh, I'm, am I right in presuming, we're saying to them, here's what we know right now. Here's uh, the list of businesses, for example. Here's the list of businesses. Here we go. What we don't know is in the future what, what may come in by way of applications. So are they, the Coastal Commission, when you inquired, are they looking at, here's the, the businesses that are already, in essence, in the program. And these amount of parking spaces will, for automobiles will be removed. There's a, some parking for bicycles and this and that, but here's how we're going to do it. So their response is, well, that looks okay to us. Going forward, where you answered my question earlier, we have no limits on this. We are not going to limit this. So presumably businesses can come in over time, years over time, make applications, Here's our ordinance. If you comply, you get it. Am I right? Um, to an extent, yes. Okay. Um, however, the way that that area is zoned, it's a small commercial node at the intersection of Seabright and Murray, mm -hmm. and it's surrounded by residential. And that's those residences are not going to become businesses because it's zoned residential. So basically, the businesses that we have there are the businesses that we have and maybe there will be very slight changes in the businesses over time. You know, it's, it's possible that 
like a convenience store might become a restaurant, but the number of businesses that could potentially um, start as new mm -hmm. restaurants and create new patios beyond what is already there mm -hmm. is um, very small. It occurs to me that uh, that on the what I'll call the west side, and especially way out on the west side, where have seen a lot of um, breweries, businesses, restaurants, and so on, seems to me that the west side is going to continue, or it's likely anyway, that it continues in that vein. There are plenty of development opportunities over on the west side and so on. Uh, are we and or the Coastal Commission uh, at all in a discussion about that because that would seem to me th those are in the coastal zone if i understand it correctly there there is a portion of the west side industrial area in the coastal zone the vast majority of that is within a half mile of a major transit stop so they would so, be so they would be exempt from this uh, they don't basically they don't have a parking requirement so there is no there is no they have parking spaces but they would not be there would be no requirement to replace them with anything. Mm -hmm. And the Coastal Commission is comfortable with that. that. That works for them. Yes. Very good. Thank you very much. This will be the opportunity for the public to comment on this item. And Mr. Ewing, up to three minutes. Didn't even have to ask. Of course not, we're here to serve. That's wonderful. So probably most of your ears are burning on the other side of this maritime courtroom wall, but at least one other person in this room might be. First of all, I'm really glad that I have more free time. Because when I initially saw the information that was posted, it was kind of exactly like what I thought someone was talking about a couple months ago and I said I would love to help you with this years before I ever stood before you guys I was dealing with the county of Santa Cruz and the city of Santa Cruz dealing with code compliance and red tags and I am not the sharpest tool in the shed but I can read slow but I can read but when you have binders about the codes and you point out that they're potentially leading themselves to some pretty serious lawsuits if people get together, once again, I'm really glad that this seems much easier. And I would certainly like to help anybody with that stuff. On a side note, I lost a lot of potential clients because I gave them so much information that they had the confidence to do it themselves. So where am I going with this? You know, how many businesses that I was more of a witness to because the county of Santa Cruz didn't shut down for the public for two years? I've been destroyed. I'm sure there's some similarities between all the businesses that stayed open in Carmel and in Santa Cruz because they're just drug money laundering organizations. But the businesses that have struggled to stay open, next time some crap starts, I mentioned that the uh, monkeypox was patented in 1997, full of interesting fun facts like that. How many people are gonna practice their skills as a lesser magistrate and question authority. Um, so I'm really glad that I have more free time because I would have loved to have done some professional stuff where I'm actually pretty good at, but now I get to do other stuff. But I certainly want to help the businesses that are still open stay open. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that there are all these options. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, greetings, Council. Uh, once again, uh, I, you know, I have my misgivings about the outdoor seating because it tends to obstruct um, uh, the flow of uh, pedestrian uh, foot traffic, a lot, especially in the downtown. And, uh, you know, so uh, you can say, I mean, that's one good thing that came out of COVID. Well, in some ways, not a lot of good things came out of COVID. Oh, wow. Okay. You're good. Now I'm... Uh, uh, much easier to hear, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, the uh, the cinder block construction uh, that you put uh, uh, in front of several restaurants uh, seems down down Pacific in, in a way 
uh, the edges, the corners on those are quite sharp. You don't think people are going to hurt themselves on those? Like, if, if I were uh, the city, I'd be interested in uh, grinding them back so they're not, and, and, you know, they're just a hard surface. You know, there's just a lot of rough and tumble stuff that goes on down on the mall quite often. But what I noticed is, uh, you know, prior to COVID, there were a lot of businesses that had um, uh, outdoor seating, and, uh, you know, it's just not really that big of a deal. So I'm not too sure why, um, you know, it isn't, you know, just the same process for a new business to uh, get approved for outdoor seating, and it should be, you know, kind of held to the same level of um, restraint and diligence uh, as, as those. But, I mean, I can I listed off a bunch of Jacks, Taco Bell, Togos, Taqueria, Santa Cruz, Subway, um, Charlie Hong Kong's. I think sort of. Uh, uh, then there are businesses oh, and chocolate. Uh, there are businesses like uh, Burger and Dorina Schnitzel that are no longer around, um, but that had that. But um, yeah, basically. Um, I don't think every uh, restaurant should have outdoor seating. I mean, I think there's reasons why you you permit it and you you know and have it be a case by case because you know uh, restaurateurs you know know this quite well as uh, you know the way a, a restaurant succeeds is its location. Um, but uh, you know, in some ways, like 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 uh, what I was complaining about uh, with the um, the fenced in area in front of uh, New Leaf and the two kiosks there at Lincoln and Pacific. Um, that that's that's really kind of a bubble that public space is then crowded out. You know, it's it's narrowed, it's attenuated around it. And I'm glad that those uh, uh, those uh, wrought iron. I mean, they they were nice fences. I'm sure they could be used for something else. But I'm glad they got taken out. Anyway, I don't uh, I don't have much else to say. That's not going to sound like rambling. So I hope uh, some of what I said made sense. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Next person in line. Good afternoon. Hi again, everyone. Um, I'm Karen Madura, owner of Brady's, the jury room, and um, acting manager at the Rush Inn. Um, I wanted to say thank you to everyone for all of the hard work that we've been doing. Um, as we all know, this is a lifeline to us to have this um, be considered. Um, that being said, we I am still um, concerned about the costs and um, the viabil viability um, as this plan stands. Um, and I do see a lot of work from the city in reducing that, and I'm very grateful. Um, and, you know, again, asking for more help or asking why economic development doesn't, um, you know, actually want to help us, even though they're offering loans, they're not um, offering help, was a question I had. Um, I was also reading through this report, and one of the recommendations from the Planning Commission um, was to have the City Council ad hoc reach out to our state um, representatives to see if uh, there was any movement or any um, anything like that, and I uh, didn't see a response in the report, so um, I was hoping for some follow-up on that, um, and um, yeah. Um, another ask would be to um, extend it to 2028 or 2030 to give time to look at um, what the state maybe could help us with and um, if that's not an avenue that we're able to go down to um, give us a chance to raise funds to make this happen. Um, again, we're committed to having this be um, wonderful for the city in terms of tax, do tax dollars um, and great for all of our constituents and make it work in the neighborhood. So um, just want to keep moving this process forward and in a positive direction for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Patrice Boyle. I'm the owner of um, La Posta Restaurant, former owner of Swaff Wine Bar downtown. I have been in business um, on um, Murray and Seabright location since 2006. We stayed open during the pandemic the whole time. Everybody in my kitchen remained on payroll. Part of that was because we had the opportunity to do something that was somewhat outside the box. So I appreciate the effort by the everybody involved here, um, but would like to urge the city to do more. Um, 
I'm sure, or maybe you have, I'm sure you've heard of the, the commercial, outdoor commercial patio ordinance in the city of Fremont. Here, I can share this with you. I downloaded it, but I can read this. Um, they allow, uh, in 2022, they re reformatted how they work, and they allow 750 square feet um, th uh, permitted through a zoning administrator, and it costs $500. They don't require, and I was happy to see on this um, new iter uh, iteration that uh, we can, if we only do 300 square feet, we can hand draw something instead of what was previous, oh, required in the previous, um, uh, was uh, signed architectural drawings. Um, I, th I want everyone to understand how much support outdoor dining has um, from the citizens of this city. I mean, it's, it's really, really very, very supportive. And this ordinance, if passed, will probably reduce the amount of outdoor dining space on private property by about 75%, okay? So I am just trying to make that percentage be a little bit smaller. Um, I would like, I um, support the um, city, uh, the planning department's um, efforts to, or suggestion that this be extended to 2026. Uh, the state extended this, um, the program very specifically to um, support restaurants and outdoor dining to, I believe it is July, um, July of 2026. And that would, I think, not only allow us to reach out as the planning department or planning commission has re recommended to state um, people to try to fix this or to change it, but I do think that Santa Cruz has the opportunity to really change the picture here for the whole state. So I would like to see that happen. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and thank you for operating your very fine restaurant. Anyone else wish to testify? We have someone online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Um, yes, this is Garrett. Um, I knew Mike again. Uh, I, I didn't really prepare anything. I mean, this is sort of the same old stuff. You know, I'm kind of, you know, basically okay with private property doing whatever they want. Although, as you know, if less parking spaces do impact the rest of the neighborhood a little bit, maybe, you know, it's a little anti-competitive also since not every business has parking spaces to to use up with outdoor dining. So you're kind of just interfering with the free market there. But mostly it's this public right of way, external outdoor seating that's got some issues. Uh, I, I don't know how, you know, the public really weighs in on specific uh, locations. Um, you know, every location is a little different as to what effect it might have. This is sort of a blanket extension. Don't really understand why it's so long. Uh, and I do, and this is something that's really kind of critical to understand. I mean, there's this assumption that it's this net uh, economic benefit. And yet I wonder, and I've said this before, you know, really does just adding more tables all over town, does that really increase the net amount of diners that eat out? Or are they all just stealing, you know, market share from each other? Whoever can expand the most gets the most customers, you know, because people don't want to wait to eat or anything. So if there's more tables somewhere else, they, they maybe go over there, you know, and I don't think you have an answer for that. I don't think you have any data on that. Um, and perhaps in that case, if there really is no net increase in customers, perhaps the only net beneficiary is the government collecting all these fees for everything. And, and then there's all this expense of creating these outdoor spaces, which is a, you know, it's an expense for businesses and, and uh, and it's and it, it's a it's an expansion war. It's like I, I got to have outdoor spaces to compete with the next guy, you know. And and if there aren't more customers, I, I mean, I don't know if that ends well for the businesses as much as you think it does. And then the parking, yeah, less pro public parking. People use cars. Cars are legal. Visitors use cars. 
you know, I mean, there's there's something you can get away with, but is that I mean, the right thing to do, you know? And then there's this exclusive use of the public right of way that you're really just sort of auctioning off for the benefit of various businesses and the public, that's a net loss to the public. You know, can't ignore that, you know? And um, um, let's see, um, I surely, I think the businesses have recovered and, and haven't they gotten their use out of the temporary seating that they have? You know, and it's just interfering with the free market to the city's financial benefit, uh, using the public right of way uh, as a freebie, and it benefits a few special interests. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Yes. We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome. Three, two, one. Anyone else online? Hello. Well, hello. hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Hi, my name is uh, Max Trigliato. I'm the owner of Mission West Bar, uh, formerly the old watering hole, purchased about six months before COVID hit. Um, I am also on the subcommittee, have been to the eight plus meetings over, I think, a year or two. And, um, you know, to reiterate, we've, we've gotten down to about $7,000 in savings in maybe two or three months of administrative uh you know permitting which i'm appreciative but um contrary to the last person's um, understanding the tax revenue that these businesses are collecting um, alone pays for that seven thousand probably within a quarter or two of business and that is actual data collected you can talk to ian down at hula's and um, ask him how much business they've lost with uh, reducing their square footage, um, huge amount of business, and um, same with Lupolo, which also includes um, employees that he had to fire and let go. So we, we spent a lot of time on this. We, we kind of are where we are. I think economic development uh, did what they can, and it seems like we're, we're ending it, uh, state building code issues. And all of us um, are, are really feeling that that's the biggest issue here is that we're getting thrown to state building, or I'm sorry, to city building without having any knowledge of what is going to be thrown at us. You know, each spot is different, which I understand. I know for mine alone, to add the bathroom that I'll be re required to add, $30,000 minimum, and that's that's on the low end. I know other people, just to add a bathroom could be 50 to 100, and there's a lot more issues that could come up. Um, we could be looking at fire sprinklers. We could be looking at all types of issues and it's so unknown. And so if that really is the way that unfortunately we're gonna go, I have to agree with Patrice, we're gonna lose a lot of these businesses and outdoor seating, possibly more than just their outdoor seating. Um, it's, it could be a lot more than that. And so I would also like to back Karen up and saying, I think we ought to go farther than 2026 because as most people know in this town, building department does not move fast and it could be it could be a year or two before we actually find out what needs to be done to expand and not only the time that it takes to get there but we need to understand the expenses and we need to save up for those expenses so if this really is the end of the road and and this is all we're going to get is kind of thrown to a building department i would ask for more than than uh, 2026 of june which i think is where we're at right now um, i'm already getting wedding reservations for end of uh, 2025, I assume 2026 is uh, not far behind that. And uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Matters back before the body, pleasure of the body. Ms. Kaltar Johnson is recognized. Thank you. I would like to make a motion. Um, to accept staff recommendation and I can read that. There we go. Um, and then I've added a third part to it. So acknowledge the environmental determination introduced for publication in ordinance amending chapter 24.10, sections 24.12190, and 24.12 um, and adding sections 24.102342 and 24.12191 to streamline permitting for private property outdoor seating areas for eating and drinking establishments. 
um, part two, acknowledge the environmental determination and introduce for publication an ordinance amending uncodified ordinance number 2020-27, extending temporary use of certain adjacent public streets and outdoor areas for eligible businesses that extends the temporary period for commercial use on private property from May 31st, 2025 to July 1st, 2026. And then part three, direct mayor to send a letter to state representatives to advocate for all cities to adopt state building code interpretation that does not trigger any new required bathroom fixtures for businesses within with 300 square feet or less of outdoor dining or drinking area. There is a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. And second, and you may open on your motion. Great. Um, I, I just, I first want to acknowledge um, the businesses who are here and who aren't here, um, who have been with us, I think more than a year actually, this process really started in 2022. Uh, you have put a lot of time and thought into this and, and your voices have helped us get to where we are and it's helped us think out of the box and push and stretch. Um, we also had residents who participated who also brought some very legitimate concerns to us, so that helped shape it. Our planning commissioners who saw this item two times and really put a lot of thought into it. And then of course, the, the dynamic staff that we have um, and all the work that you've put into the, to, to bringing us really what I think a framework that um, is better than many other frameworks as we heard through your presentation. Uh, no other jurisdiction in our county is doing something like this. Um, only one out of the 14 cities we've surveyed, San Diego, um, is following the same um, type of a framework. So I think we've, we've pushed and stretched ourselves, and, and I hear the concerns of those who spoke, Karen and Max and Patrice. Um, I don't run a business like yours, um, but I do know running a small business is, is a challenging um, task that you have. So um, I, think, I think we've landed in the right place and we're going in the right direction. I've added the third component uh, because as was pointed out both through the presentation and through the speakers, uh, we are constrained by state code and state law. Um, some of it is legitimate health and safety reasons and some of it, it's, it's state law and, and we're not, we don't know why we can't stretch, um, have the state law stretch. So that's why the added direction of, um, of uh, having other cities interpret that fixture component of the 300 square feet. I'm not art articulating it very well because I'm not a planner, but you explained it really well on the agenda. And um, I think, uh, you know, we've done some research and we've done some digging. And I think this is the extent that we can push our state advocates to move in the direction that we feel is a better fit for our businesses. Um, so I think with that, um, I'll, I'll leave it there. For the debate or discussion, Councilmember Brunner. Thank you. Um, I I wonder if the motion maker. I just um, wanted to um, add some language on your item three with the state um, letter, and I think there's a component of state advocacy in in this as well. And however you want. Um, that language um, to be worded rather than specific to interpreting the code the same. Um, the code that triggers, the, build, the state building code that triggers um, a required restroom or um, certain uh, infrastructure over 300 square feet, that there's also a request for support um, uh, from the state uh, so I'm wondering Do if you want to propose the language, how you want it said. Um, <laughs> I don't have anything in mind, and um, I I can try and talk it, and just add if you can pull it up. The motion and her item three. Uh, okay, direct mayor to send a letter to state representatives to advocate for all cities to adopt state building code interpretation that does not trigger any new required bathroom fixtures for businesses with 600 square feet or less of outdoor dining or drinking area. 
What piece do you see missing that you'd like added? A, a state uh, more flexibility and uh, support and financial as well. Um, and I know this came up in several of our meetings. Um, so I don't know if it needs to go in here, if we can have this discussion um, as the letter is written. I know that there's a draft that can be, maybe it can simply, I'm giving direction to include that point in the draft letter. That might be the simplest way to do that. It's not just about the bathroom code and, and advocating that all cities have the same interpretation of the code. As we see, there was, um, you know, different cities that were researched, and there are different codes. So, um, let me see if this might work for you. How about we do this? I think I I am clear on. I think I am clear on the sentiment you are expressing. How about I do this? I think that the direction for the mayor to communicate with our state legislators is broad enough. How about uh, I will show you the draft. I think that it fits with the in, within the ambit of the current motion, and I'd be glad to consult with you before I send that Thank letter. Thank you. You're certainly welcome. I appreciate for the debate that. And discussion. We'll go to Mr. Newsom, then Ms. Brown, and move our way around here, sir. Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to uh, quickly just thank my colleagues, Councilmember Kalatari Johnson and Councilmember uh, Bruner for their uh, work uh, on the subcommittee. I also want to thank staff for their work on this and thank uh, those who uh, spoke today uh, on this agenda item. Um, you know, just want to associate myself with the comments of Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. We, uh, the program was set up to try to streamline the program as much as possible without running afoul of state law and providing an extension uh, that's provided by state law of, of two years from now. And um, just want to thank everybody for their work and uh, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Brown is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to also share my appreciation with the subcommittee and economic development staff. I know you have really worked hard to find the, um, you know, the, all of the areas where the challenges facing our local businesses, you know, can can be effectively addressed. Um, and it, it is incredibly complex. And so I just appreciate your time sticking with it. Um, it, it seems like in what we're what we've been presented with is is significantly different and and much more streamlined and um, hopefully effective, productive for business owners than where we started. And I remember having meetings with business owners about both um, for the parklet program, the public space, but also on the the private side. Um, a lot of particular challenges related to the space they inhabit and the conditions at the leasing or ownership and all of those other things. But the common themes really were about, um, it's particularly for the private, um, private outdoor dining, parking and restrooms. And so I see this as a really great step forward. I also want to recognize that, that there will be businesses, and we're hearing from some of them, who are going to be affected by this. And, and I don't want to see them slip through the cracks and just disappear. Um, and so I'm wondering, I have, I guess, a couple of follow-up questions. Um, one related to the extension, uh, the timeline. I know we had extended until 2025. At the time, I said, can we have a longer extension? Because I know you all are going to come back, and this is going to happen, and here we are. Um, that doesn't provide, um, uh, you know, some certainty for business, right? I mean, they're going to keep hoping that if we can't figure it out, that there's they may be able to find a way forward. Is the t the time extension um, is that something that you think can be adjusted? Um, could we have a longer time period for people to work it out? Could we have some kind of maybe report back to, you know, so that this, this it, we don't all just go away and then leave businesses to try to figure this out. Um, some way to kind of inventory, you know, progress on this and what still is outstanding. Um, is that possible? And why, Councilmember Brown? I'm one going year. To, uh, let me stay with the. So the, it's all they're all kind of together. What, can we do a longer extension? Why you guys picked this time period? Um, let and me or, start or with back. staff on a response. Thank you. 
you have a response on this? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that the 2020, you know, we, we need to have an end date to this. These were set up under emergency parameters. Um, and so I think being consistent with the state law is sort of that date that we looked at. Those temporary alcohol, you know, permits are set to expire at that date. And so, you know, that could be a technical issue that comes up if we extended this longer and businesses don't have that permanent expansion. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're sort of comfortable with this and being able to provide, you know, essentially two years from this point, we're a little bit past that deadline um, to move this forward. And I think also with this proposal, um, having, you know, the hourly review for the 300 square foot, these rules are going to be in place going forward. This isn't a one or done thing for the businesses. So if it's a matter of needing to scale down, I mean, we absolutely want to see our businesses be able to keep as much outdoor dining space as they can. But if they need to scale down to, you know, meet the deadline and be able to move forward with permanent, they're able to apply for a building permit to change that, to expand as they go further and have, you know, the capital and the means to do that. Um, is sort of how we've been looking at it. Okay, um, I, I think that the questions around restrooms are really related to state building code and so I'm not even going to go there. I, I really appreciate you all working through that. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll, you know, I, I want to support this. I mean, absolutely thrilled to see the progress that's been made, um, but I'm, I'm going to say I am worried about um, how some businesses are going to be able to do, move forward. I mean, if, if you don't have any capital to make that investment up front, um, if you need an extra restroom, for example, because you do want to maintain larger outdoor dining, which benefits the city, as we know, um, you know, I just feel like there, it's, there's some unresolved stuff there. And so I would like to see some space available for businesses to continue to work. I don't know if your subcommittee is done with your work and tired now. I don't want to ask you to keep going, but um, <laughs> is there some, just some space, some mechanism by which people can like not fall through the cracks? <laughs> yeah, I, um, absolutely. I mean, my role in economic development is to support these businesses through these processes. Um, you know, Karen did mention we have loan program. We have, you know, those are below interest, you know, below market rate uh, micro loans that would be, you know, applicable to this cause and certainly can help, you know, businesses navigate that process if it's something that fits in, and is what they want to pursue. Um, and I think certainly, you know, being able to assist them evaluating what the approach is and working through with the building department and um, planning to facilitate that process. I mean, Edie is not done with this role. This is, you know, we're continuing through as you know we have the process in place and can now really get into the details with businesses individually so definitely continuing to be supportive and, and be that resource that we can help them move forward thanks council member watkins is recognized thank you um yeah, thank you for the questions i i feel comfortable with with your response and i know that you are very committed to supporting our businesses i too just want to thank my council colleagues and all the folks that were um, coming together to come up with this comprehensive policy. I know it's not perfect, not, um, most policies aren't, but you do your best to balance it all. And I think we're ahead of the game based on the other uh, jurisdictions that are compared. And it's really good for our community. And I think outdoor dining has been a great um, asset and expansion and our ability to be able to um, support the businesses and moving forward in a streamlined process is a, is a good step forward. I do appreciate the added direction. I think it'd be helpful at the state to have some guidance there for other jurisdictions. I know other jurisdictions do grapple with this. I was talking to some of the other cities in Monterey County that are struggling with this as well. And so having some, some broader um, state guidance will be really helpful. So I appreciate that added direction. Those conclude my comments. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Council members? President. If I might ask a question then uh, of uh, I don't think I do want to ask a question because that was previously the matters back before the body. I will say this, unless there is some objection we've heard that uh, an extension of this July 1st, 2026 deadline, uh, I am going to assume, uh, unless I am told otherwise, that that is a date we choose. Uh, is there a reason we would not choose, for example, January 1st, 2027? Is there a reason we would not do that? Is there a legal reason? I'm not asking staff because 
this matters back before the body. I'm asking essentially those who've labored on this issue for quite a while, is there a reason we would not do that? We wanted to be in alignment with the state law and um, my understanding is that there could be some technical challenges if the state law is now saying one thing and then our ordinance is saying another, but that's my understanding. Okay. And, and, and I'll add that um, we've had a, 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 a quite a long runway, yes. um, longer than some most other jurisdictions. Right. And we know that our staff is available to help those businesses. So of those of you who are on this body, the, the ad hoc group that testified, you're comfortable with that date. There's no need in your estimation to extend that date to, to six months beyond that or something of that nature. You're comfortable with this date. I mean, I think we, you know, I think there will be, my understanding is there could be some challenges between what the state law then says and what we say. And if it weren't for that, we could just keep extending it. And at some point we want to have something that's in the books that we're all consistent about that new businesses and existing businesses under the emergency mm -hmm. um, extension mm -hmm. are, are kind of moving a line together. I see, okay, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. For the debate or discussion, seeing hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Pellantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye, motion passes and so ordered. We have now, I believe, Ms. Bush completed our business. Mr. Condotti completed our business. We have. Motion to adjourn would be in order. The vice mayor, with deep reluctance, uh, moves adjournment. And Council Member Brown, with equal <laughs> reluctance, makes a second non-debatable. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, motion carries as so ordered. We stand adjourned. Okay.